Okay, let's turn to 1 Peter, and uh, I'm starting introductory matter of 1 Peter this morning, and I'll be preaching through 1 and 2 Peter as my goal right now. So as you're turning there, let's bow together in the Lord's Prayer. Father, this morning as we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we break open the bread of life, the word of God, and Lord, as we enter into this epistle this morning, and in the months ahead, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us the things that are contained therein. I pray, Lord, that you would weld them upon our soul, and I pray, Lord, that they would be there permanently, and that we would learn how to deal with life the difficulty of life in the right now. And I pray as we do that, Lord, we know that you get the glory. But we also know, Lord, we have promises that cannot be taken away from us that have been given by you. And so, Lord, I pray you would help us to look forward to that, especially, Lord, in times of trouble. And I pray this this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this morning I am going to be looking at some introductory matter in first peter the first uh the epistle of first peter is really a rich theological message of the practical presentation of the christian life while we are living on this planet as aliens and temporary residents in this world uh, before i get really into the exposition of the epistle of First Peter, I must deal with some fundamental introductory matters. And the reason for that is uh, anytime you are looking at a new book, you want to uh, understand that uh, we need to know from the epistle who wrote it, when was it written, why was it written, where was it written from, and things of this particular nature. That would give us a good handle and as we get into the epistle that we have some sense of what it's going to be teaching. And, so we'll, and then we'll look at the details in the exposition. So the Apostle Peter, of course, uh, most likely wrote this letter to the scattered church shortly before or after the burning of Rome. Uh, the Apostle Peter was a member of, remember, Jesus' inner circle and was a spokesman for the 12 other apostles. Uh, his ministry from, Pe from Pentecost until the Jerusalem Council is recorded in the book of Acts. After that, he seems to disappear. Tradition says that he was crucified upside down by Nero approximately at 67 AD. However, we cannot know for sure if Peter was, in fact, martyred under Nero, even though some conclude from several passages of Scripture that Peter's death is seen as prophesied, like in John chapter 21, where it says, now this he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So some from that passage of scripture indicate that uh, he knew what kind of death he would actually die. And of course, historians su surmise that Nero had uh, Rome burned and then he blamed it on the Christians after he had burned Rome. So then uh, this really does allow for Peter to be present in Rome between 60 to 64 AD, where he penned 1 Peter, and of course, uh, in 62, between 62 and 63, and then 2 Peter uh, between 63 and 64. So Peter did pen uh, this epistle uh, from Rome, and uh, as I have already mentioned some of these things, the date is between 62 and uh, 64. Five on our screen there, either shortly before or shortly after the persecution of the uh, when Emperor Nero burnt Rome. All right, so the audience 
uh, would be right in verse number one of First Peter. Look at that. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are chosen. All right, so that is the audience of who we're talking about. And if you notice on the map that these particular places are pretty much north uh, of this section of that part of the world. And so there was a lot of commerce uh, during that part of the world. And these providence, provinces were primarily Gentile, but with a large number of Jews living in them. Therefore, both groups uh, are addressed as forming the Church of Jesus Christ in these regions. At Pentecost, in the book of Acts, there were pilgrims from the Parthenians, the Medes, the Emulites, the residents of Mesopotamia, and then Judea, and then it says Cappadocia, um, Pontus, and Asia. Out of these, both the Jews and the Gentiles were scattered from Jerusalem area all the way up through these regions. Now, the occasion of this, the writings were uh, that the occasion that ever arose really from a report received by Peter that these believers were experiencing sharp opposition and persecution uh, because of their faith. The church at that point entered into really a 200 year period of Christian persecution. The Christians in Asia Minor, those sections right there on the map, were distressed because of the hostility and the persecution they were experiencing. As a result of, of, of this persecution, they were deeply discouraged and distraught. Now, suffering, whenever we, we experience suffering, it has many forms to it. It could be physical abuse, it could be emotional abuse, it, it could be social uh, being a social outcast by a particular group. It could be uh, some kind of persecution that takes many different uh, colors in its level and in its degree. Uh, but pain or suffering does cause anguish in our soul. And of course, pain or suffering or persecution can be a temptation for people to turn their back on Christ to surrender to the Christian life, uh, to give in and saying, listen, I became a Christian, never thought there'd be persecution or suffering. I thought it was just gonna be a bunch of roses. I thought it was just gonna be a smooth pass, right? Right into heaven. And we find out life happens, right? And suffering is part of the Christian life. Persecution is part of the Christian life. And it could be that persecution that comes when we believe in Christ. We come to Christ, all of a sudden, our friends don't want anything to do with us. We come to Christ, all of a sudden, our family uh, is pushing us away and or organizing things knowing that we'd be in church on Sunday, and they organize it just on Sunday, hoping that you would be there, but you don't show up. And so, all of a sudden, persecution comes. On the job, you may not get a promotion because you're a Christian. You may be uh, asked to do menial tasks because they know you're a Christian, and they expect you as a Christian to do those things without complaint. See, so many forms of persecution can come into our life. And so what do we do when being torn, overwhelmed, and devastated, and even crushed by the suffering and, uh, of life where we are marginalized because we know Christ, because we're believers in this world, uh, how do we have a proper perspective on suffering? Because suffering is really the test. It's the acid test of your faith. All right? Hey, as long as things are going good, hey, I'm happy, I can rejoice, I can have fun and do all those things. But as soon as problems come, then what happens? We begin to grumble. We begin to complain. 
we begin to show a side of us that, well, wait a minute, is not a, necessarily a Christian one, but it's coming out of our heart. See, this is what was going on in First Peter, that the people were really under persecution where they were becoming disillusioned and deeply discouraged. So what does Peter do? The Apostle Peter writes a well-thought-out theology of suffering. That's what he does. And it's not just for the people back then. It's for us, too, today. And he was writing it so in their marginalized position in this world, they would be brought into a perspective. They would be brought and given a perspective on suffering that is completely and truly biblical. Now, Peter wanted really to communicate to God's children several things in the light of and the backdrop of persecution, all right? So in this theology of suffering, the first thing he wanted to communicate to them is this, that they were special by referring to them as God's chosen and God's temple. See, Christians are to are really to be assured that they have a special status in the kingdom of God. Now, if you look verse in, in verse number one, it says in the last part of the verse, it says, who are chosen? So the people that have been scattered throughout all these regions, they are going out there knowing something that they have been chosen by God. And of course, I just got done with uh, weeks and weeks on the doctrines of grace. So part of that is election and being chosen, and that is the Greek word, electos, of being chosen by God. And so he was saying then, listen, when persecution comes, don't forget that you are special to God, that before the foundation of the world, he knew that you were going to be his children because he chose you in Christ Jesus before that time, and he knew that you were going to have suffering. In fact, God ordains the persecution. He ordains the suffering. And then if you look over to chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, it also says there that they are special because they are this new temple of God where God dwells now in his people through his spirit. It says in verse 4 of chapter 2, it says, And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but, in, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also are living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So this is the first thing in Peter's theology of suffering that he wants to assure them that they definitely are special. A second thing is this, that their residence, their residency in this world is only temporary. It's good to know that. To belong, well, the reason why is because we belong to heaven, so our future is secure. See, Christians, it is good for us to know that we are just passing through this world and we're heading for home. Again, 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, what, what do we do? We're to keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. In other words, while you're going through suffering, you have a present rejoicing. And when you look to the future, when you're in the presence of God, that you have a future rejoicing. Now, of course, it is odd to connect rejoicing with suffering. It seems like those two don't go together. But in the Christian life, they go together. That you have not only been chosen to be saved, but you have also been chosen to suffer in this world. And to know that, listen, you are the real aliens. Right? We're, we're, we're the alien movie right here. Right? We are only here temporarily. We are just passing through. It is good to know that. Our bodies are growing old. Things that we have break and fall apart. The whole world has gone nuts, all right? So why would we want to put our investment here? Our investment ought to be in heaven. It is good to know that, listen, 
We're only here for a short period of time. The grass withers, right? You cut the grass and, 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 and just, you know, withers, flowers wither, things decay and grow old. And so we are only here for a short period of time. But while we're here, if we're going to live properly, we have to learn to rejoice when it's going bad and rejoice when it's going good and rejoice when life seems to not be joyful, but we're joyful anyway because we have, we have an otherworldly reason to be joyful. That's why. Our joy is not to be found here, even though there are many things to cause joy in our life and in our uh, situations. But nonetheless, we have available to us present rejoicing and future rejoicing. And then there's a third thing in his theology, and I'm generalizing these because we're going to look at the details later on, that the, their Lord Jesus Christ has won the battle and ensures their victory, their vindication, and their reward. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 7. It says, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, in light of these truths, Christians must live as children and citizens of heaven. Now, saying that, that means in the epistle, of Peter, Christians are given a responsibility, all right? And that responsibility is, is and th matter of fact, this responsibility is demanded of us, of course, Christians, when there's a command given to us in scripture, it's not like we are responding to the command like, I have to do this, remember, that we want to do it. We want to do it because we love the Lord, all right? So what is the what is demand? It demands a lifestyle of holiness. You cannot separate genuine conversion to Christ without including a holy life because the Spirit of God is actually doing that. He is making us holy, different, separated unto God. So for the child of God, holiness is to take on a noticeable difference in how they live which becomes visible when God's people are being specially abused, mistreated, misunderstood, marginalized by others, even others that are close to you. See, the Christian's response is to all this opposition, no matter the, whatever way it comes, is to be rich in good works, and to have attitudes of blessing even on those who are persecuting you. For 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says, notice what it says there. It says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slandered you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, if you notice in that passage of Scripture that it's not initially, immediately right now that they will glorify God, but in the end they will. They will glorify God. In other words, Christians, because of your present position in Christ and the future blessing guaranteed to you, let your lives be as witnesses for Christ in this hostile world. So that means that scriptures do affirm the inevitability of persecution against the true church, uh, which is really comprised of the disciples of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because Christians bring the exclusive message of the gospel and bear the ever-growing characteristic of a transformed life to their workplace and to their families and to their neighbors and to their, uh, in the places that they end up. And the reason why is that because the Holy Spirit is making them holy. The Christian brings to the world the standard of Jesus Christ, which is clearly different from the persons of the world. So then the Christian is a kind of conscience 
to any society in which it exists. The world and its system does not like when the conscience is pricked by truth, especially when it goes against their philosophy of life or their worldview. But remember what the apostle John told us in John chapter 3, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So that passage of scripture is very clear to us that we are to live a life that is completely different that is different than our old way of life, and that different lifestyle becomes evident for one reason, that you became a believer in Jesus Christ, and now you are truly redeemed by God, you have the Spirit of God living in you, you have the Word of God in your hands, and God is changing you. In fact, look at this passage of scripture in 1 Peter, look at chapter four, verse three and four, because here, the Apostle Peter mentions the difference in lifestyle after one comes to Christ. Now, you may have experienced this. I've experienced this passage of Scripture. Notice what it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 3. It says, For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, verse 4, in all this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excess of dissipation, and they malign you for that. See, as long as you were partying with them, that was wrong. But now, now... Hey, they say, once you party with us and you were willing to do all kinds of mischief with us and have good times with us, now you're a goody two-shoes, holy roller Bible thumper. That's who you are now. You're so different. You're weird now. And, and so they say you're brainwashed and, and you're no more fun to hang around. When you get over your religious phase, uh, come look us up and we'll get drunk or high together. That's what my friends told me when I try to witness to them after I gave the gospel. Of course, rightfully so, because I used to party with them. Right? I used to go with them. And, and, and of course, all those things you listed, we used to do that. But now that we've come to Christ, those days have ended. And see, if they have not ended in your life, there's a real big problem. Because If the Spirit of God is living in you, you will be under such heavy conviction about the way you lived your life, you'll have to get rid of things. See, mark this truth on your calendar, Christian. Followers of Christ, the very goodness of God is in your life. And that goodness is an offense to the world. They regard your goodness as a handicap. They don't regard your goodness as something beneficial. So the purpose statement that Peter has in Scripture is that Peter calls persecuted Christians to live a holy life as children of God and citizens of heaven, pointing them to the example of Christ and their future hope. There it is right there. Christ is my example in living a life even when it comes to persecution and suffering. And my future hope is my motivation in life too while I'm going through trouble. So the literary style that Peter uses in his writing is that of uh, end time view of life. The the centrality of the end of all things is all over 1 Peter. See, 1 Peter is focused on eschatological salvation, the end result. Salvation is really a present experience, but it progresses through life. And the end or the goal of one's life, of one's faith, is the salvation of the soul. 1 Peter chapter 1, look verse number 9. 
It says, obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See, so that is the end result for Peter. You have to know that, that whatever we're going through between now and the end has been ordained by God. We are, we are not left alone. Uh, it, this passage of scripture and others have an outlook that looks at the end of all things. In other words, believers live in a tension between the here and now and the future. While we live in the here and now, the current sufferings prepare us for both final judgment and final salvation. And while we traverse this world with all its instabilities and uncertainties, Christians have a strength, have a hope, have a certainty for the future that no one else has. You realize that, right? See, and that's the way we have to live our lives. We have to live our lives with this hope intact, with this understanding intact. Now, why is this? Because of the primacy of two major end-time events. One has taken place already, and one is yet future. The first a primary major of future event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that as the basis of our salvation. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And our hope, too. So we, uh, it's the basis for our salvation. It is the basis for our hope. It actually took place. Jesus' sacrifice was accepted by the Father. And so that means that Jesus won the battle against all the evil forces, against Satan and death, and proclaimed defeat after his resurrection. Therefore, the Christian can resist the human opponent as well as the demonic forces against them. That's why you find passages like this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. That is the first thing. And then we live in light of the second major end time event. And what is that? That is the second coming of Christ. The major event where now is yet, it's of course, it's still yet future, but that is a major event that is uh, emphasized in this epistle. It calls, it's called the revelation, uh, and that's how it just ends with it. And like in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13, it says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep, in sober, keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's bringing us, it's, it's bringing our minds to think about something, to think about what is yet uh, in the future for us. So the afflicted saints are to have their eyes on the end goal because it is the second coming of Christ that where the final victory will come, where the final salvation, the completion, the consummation of our salvation will come. That's why like passages like 1 Peter 4, verse 13, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. See, that is what he's saying to all of us uh, in this world that we live. Now, there are several major themes that we're going to uh, run across in this epistle, and the first one is God, it's used 39 times in this epistle. The primary thing in reference to God is his absolute sovereignty and control over this world. The center of God's plan is his chosen, redeemed people, called out of 
darkness into light and many times called into suffering situations. But in there, they maintain their eternal life and salvation. And while they're there, they're there to perform good deeds. And of course, they're going to be vindicated by God for living that way. So in other words, God gives grace to his people during suffering. And of course, he graciously gives his own life. We already know that. And that in him, even suffering is part of God's grace to us. And at the end, that God is the judge and is the only one who is able to take vengeance fairly. Uh, God has never given us the, the authority at all to take vengeance on anyone, no matter what the crime may be. That means believers leave vengeance to God who will bring fair justice so that they are free to return blessing and good works when they are slandered, when they do enter into suffering. And then, of course, a second one is uh, Jesus Christ, election, salvation. They They all go together. There's five core blessings that Peter brings out as far as Jesus Christ is concerned. The first one is that Christ is the ransom and redemption payment as the perfect lamb of God who whose sacrificial blood made salvation possible, which is the basis of our trust in God. Secondly, that Christ is the living cornerstone of God's final temple. The church on whom we are living stones erected into God's new house. And then three, that Jesus is that sinless person who personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so we, the wandering sheep, can be dead to sin and then turn to the shepherd of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the purpose of Christ's death in Peter is uh, for our sin is to bring us safely home to God. I love this passage of scripture in 1 Peter 3.18, where it says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So our response to that should be worship. Worship Christ as the Lord of our life. Peter 3.15 says... But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. See, that should be something we are considering every day. Sin is no longer my master. No one's my master. God's my master. Christ is my master. So Jesus is the means by which we share in God's eternal glory. And then we are going to see glimpses of the Trinity and the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Look at chapter 1, verse number 2. It says, right there, it says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. There you have the Father is the one who foreknows. The Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies and sets us apart, makes us holy. We cooperate with that holiness by being obedient. And then the Son, the one who cleanses with the Blood sacrifice, that is what his job was to do when he came into this world. But Jesus left this world. He went back to heaven. And he sent the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, to us. So he did that. And we know now that we'll see that we also have a new community. And what's the community? We're the community, the church. We're the aliens, yet we're the special people of God. According to the Apostle Peter, there's no reason for Christians to be discouraged. They need to reflect on who they are in Christ and how they can live in light of who they are in Christ. And they have a responsibility in Scripture to think correctly based on the Word of God. And here are some things that should dominate the mind of the followers of Christ. In other words, as we're going through life, what should we be thinking about? 
Well, the first thing we should be thinking about is we don't belong here. We are the true aliens. We are the true strangers. We are only sojourning. We're passing through the land. We're heading home. Secondly, we will have little here but await a priceless inheritance. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So see, our real inheritance is in heaven, yet we know that God gives us many things in this world. I, I would consider that all Americans would have to be blessed uh, that even on the poverty level, you're wealthier than most people who live in the world. Mm -hmm. And so we have many, many things to thank God for. But you know what? Don't put your stakes, your ten peg stakes, too firmly in the ground. Don't cement them in. Leave them in the sand because we're going home. We're not staying here. And then the third thing is while you're here, we're protected by God's power. Look at verse 5 of chapter 1. Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's that last time view all over this epistle. So you, we are protected by God. God, we're God's special uh, possession. Therefore, we, God promises us he will protect us. And that does not always mean that God's going to protect our physical life. We may die for the sake of Christ. But no one can take away the eternal salvation. No one can take away the eternal inheritance that's reserved for you in heaven. See, we're protected for eternity. And then the next thing is that we are here, while we're here, by faith we must grasp that we are God's own possession. I mentioned that. And then while we are here, we have our brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with, to serve with, to care with, to worship with, to live in light of the imminent return of Christ with. We're to do that together. That's why we have the church, so we can do that. Now, if we are not practicing thinking like this, of course, we'll find some other way of dealing with the rough road called life on this disposable, cursed planet. Cursed only because of the sin that came into it. There are plenty of drugs out there that could mask the pain. However, they produce no lasting results and usually lead to all kinds of other problems, further complicating life. Anytime I deal with people, whether it's in a good way or a bad way, that gets kind of hooked on either illegal or prescription drugs, there's always far-reaching, complicated circumstances that they put themselves in and they get themselves in. And many times, you know, well-meaning people get in that, that position. But no, we shouldn't be running to the medicine cabinets as Christians. Not that all those mercies are given to us by God in good ways, but we have to be very, very careful and wise how we use that because they can be very detrimental to our holiness, to our being affected for Christ. In this world. So we have to be very, very careful and examine ourselves on why are we involved in a, a certain regimen of uh, possibly drugs. Is, is it to mask the pain? Is, the, is it to cover up the hurt? Is, is it to just deal with life because that's the only way you know how to deal with life? That's not how we ought to be doing it. That's not thinking correctly. We have to think correctly as believers. God wants to change our understanding of life. So we can live in a very responsible way. Now that also means that there is a responsibility for Christians. And I already mentioned it, we are to live lives of holiness. So believers belong to God, therefore are responsible to live differently from their former way of life. We are to be holy in everything we do. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, like the Holy One, you who are called, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. See, we're never to be perfect, but we are to be holy. Holiness means both to 
live apart from the world and to live for God. So the saints are to abstain from all the vices of their former way of life and to place all their trust in God rather than the world. See, the bottom line is that saints are to be responsible to live right for God. They are to pursue holiness. And, and why is that? There's several reasons. First, holiness is required for our well-being. It's required for our well-being. So we are called to and must earnestly strive for personal and practical holiness in our lives. That means believers are, are to be set apart from evil, but separated to God, consecrated, and entirely given up to his service. Secondly, holiness is necessary for effective service to God. We have to be holy to actually serve God rightly. It says in Timothy, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. See, to be affected in service, you have to be holy. You can't be living two lives. You can't be having something going on secretly nobody knows about and give the face of Christianity to those you know think you're Christian. You can't do that. God knows that, right? So, and it, doesn't, it may not mean that you're not a Christian. It may mean that you need to get rid of the things that you've been playing with in your mind and your heart so you can live effectively for God. And also, holiness is necessary for the assurance of your salvation. If you are not living a holy life, how can you be assured that you're a believer? Right? The only safe evidence that we are in Christ is a holy life. Jerry Bridges said that. He writes some good stuff. Recommends stuff that he wrote for you to read. If you know nothing of holiness, you shouldn't flatter yourself that you're a Christian. And here's the bottom line. It is not those who profess to know Christ who will enter heaven, but those who live holy lives. So, that means, that brings us to this suffering. But there's a strategy for victory over it in 1 Peter. That's why he writes it. He's giving us a strategy in dealing with the difficult times, the, the rough roads, uh, the people that are against us as believers, the tests of our faith. See, the primary form of persecution may not even be what you would sometimes expect. The believers were experiencing actually verbal abuse. They were accused as being wrongdoers in chapter 2, verse 12. In chapter 3, verse 9, they were insulted for being believers. In chapter 3, verse 16, they were spoken against to others because they were believers. In chapter 4, verse 4, they were slandered because of being believers. And in chapter 4, verse number 14, they were mocked for being believers. See, they also were expecting fiery trials. In verse number, chapter 4, verse number 12, or chapter 4, verse number 12, it says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ. See, so these will come. These persecutions were really in the form of vile slander and calamitous attacks against them because they were Christians. They were being hated uh, and suspect because they withdrew, they withdrew from the licentious practices and amusements of their pagan neighbors and families uh, and apparently they were also charged as being disloyal to the state of Rome. All right, so this, this is what I, I just mentioned. See, and that, that means several things, that under this uh, point of this suffering and the strategy for victory over it, 
is that these Christians had a lot of pressure to adapt to Roman values, to Roman customs, to Roman culture, as well as expectation to follow Rome, Rome's ethical and moral standards, which were totally opposite of God's standards. Isn't that what Hollywood tries to do with people? Young people have so much pressure on them because they don't look a certain way or they don't wear certain clothes or they don't listen to certain music or we, they don't follow a certain group, All right? And, and so the, the peer pressure in high schools is tremendous on young people, but we're all bombarded by the world trying to get us to think like they think, to have their ethical and moral standard. Also, these people had pressure to be pro-Roman and show loyalty to Rome. See, that Rome wanted Christians to make a valuable contribution to Roman life. And when they didn't, they were persecuted for it. The trade routes that in in that section of those provinces uh, brought many different religious ideas to that region and to believers. Old gods were blended with new gods. That's called syncretism the Roman cult of the worship of the emperor as gods was on the rise during that time. The trade routes also brought many opportunities for pursuing and obtaining wealth, very wealthy area they were living in, and that wealth was increasing because of of the, the Black Sea there and the coastal areas of the Med. They were uh, had a lot of opportunities for wealth. So Christians were being tempted in that way to uh, either they were not able to make wealth because they were believers or they were pursuing it and leaving other things behind that were most important. Also, there was a confusion about what good meant. The Roman, for the Roman, it meant one's duty to the state and the city rather than a moral and ethical practice of good works. So they were on different spectrums when it came to what's good, what are good works. Even uh, Pilate said, you know, what's truth? Like, you know, what's, and of course, in the mindset, it was also what's good. Who, who, what, good what good to you is different than what good is to me. All right, so there was a difference. But the Christians understood what goodness was based on the word of God, based on their relationship to Christ. So... Christians were citizens of heaven rather than citizens of Rome. But I tell you what, we're citizens of the United States, right? Uh, But I tell you what, you want to know know what makes the best citizen? A Christian citizen. A Christian will be one of the best citizens because they will do things that honor God, and when we honor God, everybody gets honored in some respects. So Christians were citizens of heaven rather than citizens of Rome, and that means that Christians were naturally, naturally marginalized and rejected, just like in some respects we are today. Maybe not to the extent that was happening here, but in different parts of the world, Christians are not uh, welcomed in any realm of society and even are killed for their faith. And so we have to consider that. Uh, now, there's three elements, as I come to an end here, there's three elements in the Christian's end-time perspective of, uh, perspective of suffering that is brought out in Timothy. And I'd like you to look at these passages with me. And, of course, it's going to be, um, the first one is going to be suffering is a sign of faith's genuineness. You have to ask yourself, okay, I'm a Christian. I'm going through trouble. Why is that? Well, look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It says, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials so that, here it is, the reason, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation 
of Jesus Christ. So suffering tests our faith to see if it's genuine. Don't you know, you, don't you uh, know that your faith needs to be tested? All Christians' faith will be tested. And the only way it's going to be tested is by trials, by suffering. Because really at that point, it shows what's, how much you learned, how much you're putting into practice, how holy you have, holy, how much you've grown in holiness, right? How much you honor what God thinks about how you live your life based on what everybody else thinks. All right, many things are going to come out in suffering, but just remember here, it's going to be tested to, as a proof of your faith. And I pray that our faith comes out to be as precious gold, which is uh, all the dross of the gold once the heat is, is uh, brought to a boiling temperature, the dross is skimmed off the top. The, the, all the impurities are skimmed off the top as the metal is brought to a boil. That's in a sense, the suffering comes in our life. All the, the stuff that we need to get rid of, we start getting rid of when the trials and the tribulations come, right? Usually when things are going good, we don't do anything. We sit there and uh, we don't take care of things that we ought to, but the trials come and we have to, right? We have to take care of them. Believers can't let them aside. And then secondly, secondly, the believer's faithfulness in suffering leads to end-time blessing, eschatological blessing. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4 again, verse 6. It says, For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to to the will of God. In other words, there's an end time blessing that goes with being a believer in Christ Jesus who has been living a life through suffering faithfully. There is a something that uh, is a blessing that comes to them because they're living their life according to the will of God. They live according to the will of God. And then thirdly, we have that God guarantees that the persecutors themselves will come to justice. 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse number 5, notice what it says, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. The accusers will give account to him about their persecutions against God's possession, believers. See, the believers, therefore, need not to fear their persecutors. They will fear instead God and live for him, not live for vengeance, because they will leave all vengeance to God because he is the righteous judge. He is the one who we commit our life to. And it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. And then chapter 2, verse number 17, it says, Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So in other words, God does guarantee that nobody will get away with anything. But it's not our job to take vengeance in our hands. And uh, of course, every movie that's made, it's about vengeance, right? I'll go get them. Get the guns, you know? And, uh, but you know what? That's not, that's not our job. Uh, believe me, your vengeance would be nothing compared to God's vengeance. God will level the the playing field. He will level it. And he promises that to us. So if we're being persecuted by people, if we're being per persecuted by government, if we're being per persecuted by something else, we have to realize it is not our job to retaliate, but to leave judgment and justice and vengeance to God alone. He will take care of it. He may take care of it presently, in the present. He may, but he will take care of everything in the future. 
So there's one last thing that I mentioned on the list, and it's that the end of the believer is hope and glory. We have hope like no one else has, and we're going to receive glory like no one can imagine. That in the midst of difficult times, believers must set their hope on their final salvation when Christ returns. Their faith and hope are in God who raised and exalted Christ and who would do the same for them, for us, and that hope will stand out in a hopeless world, and it will be noticed by people about your hope, and they will ask you about it. All right? Matter of fact, here's the passage of Scripture we always use. Look what it says, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It says this, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, 1 Peter 3, 15, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. How do we do it? Yet with gentleness and reverence. Remember, it's all removal of vengeance and retaliation is, is, is taken out of the Christian formula. All right? And so, hey, how come your perspective on life is so different than anybody else's? What's with you? Ah, chance to give the gospel, right? Chance to do good deeds to the person chance to have contact with someone who doesn't see it your way and that you could be kind to them and share with them why you have that hope, right? Why you have that hope. See, those times will give you great gospel opportunities if you live that way. But I tell you what, if you live just like everybody else around you and nobody senses anything different about your life, your language, your actions, your dress, they won't ask you anything. They'll just think you're just like them. And so being holy is being different. Different. Because you're Christ. That's how we ought to live. And that's where Peter is landing for you and I. So may this study of 1 Peter make us those kind of people. Holy people that have a hope for the future and for the present that gives us many opportunities to do good and to share the gospel with people. Let's be that kind of people. Amen? And God will receive glory, and we will our promised glory in heaven. That's the promise.